to <laughs> this round table, refugee movements and the crisis of Europe. Uh, so this round table actually was, um, is going to reflect or to um, come up with some theoretical intervention in the recent migrant and refugee crisis, the so-called refugee crisis that goes on in Europe. And it has been very, very interesting being here in the US that everyone who uh, got to know that I'm from Germany, everyone would say, oh, you poor, poor Germans, you have this uh, <laughs> refugee crisis and no one seemed to think about, I mean, the whole international global dimension of what's uh, going on in Europe, but actually, of course, it is a crisis for Europe as well. Um, so both sides of it, the refugee movements, the refugee movement, which also means uh, the kind of uh, new social and political practices and interventions that have uh, occurred during uh, this time, but also the question of uh, what this means for uh, the EU, for Europe, uh, and for the idea, the idea of a nation state is the issues that are going to be discussed uh, on this panel, this all European uh, roundtable discussion, as you might uh, realize, I'm not going to introduce the <coughs> people at last because most of you know uh, all of us. We have Daniel Leuk, who is the uh, Theodor Heuss lecturer of this year from Germany, Frankfurt. Uh, we have Cynthia Arutzer, who is, uh, Arutzer, who is uh, in the Department of Philosophy at the New School originally from, from Italy. We have our Greek contributor, no, if you're not, um, um, who is uh, based here on the, uh, at the uh, New School in the, the Political Science Department. We have Chiara, whom we all know, in the Philosophy Department, Italy, and Robin Sedicatis, whom uh, uh, probably a lot of you know, who is uh, from the University of Amsterdam, but is here during the year as a um, uh, scholar at, the, at, at Columbia University. So we are proceeding in alphabetical order and everyone has 10 minutes to come up with a statement and after the statements we will immediately open up uh, the discussion for the public. So Cynthia. So I, so I, want, I would like to start with a confession because I uh, today I had some trouble uh, organizing my thoughts and decided what to say today. And the reason is that I woke up to the news that uh, 200 uh, refugees from Somalia may have drawn um, in the Mediterranean while trying to reach the Italian coast. And the reason why this basically disrupted my day is that not only did the, the news is refining itself, but uh, it is also because uh, these 200 uh, uh, should be added to the 500 who have already drawn in the Mediterranean Sea from the beginning of the year, and to the several hundreds more who will... Uh, die in the Mediterranean Sea uh, in the coming months because uh, uh, our tr attempts to arrive by sea to the Italian coast will unavoidably increase in the, in the coming months with uh, <coughs> better weather and better sea conditions. So um, I had a bit of trouble because I, I do personally find, uh, find it a bit difficult to keep uh, some uh, analytical lucidity uh, while uh, we are facing uh, what I consider to be a uh, humanitarian crisis of uh, absolutely horrific proportions and horrific dimensions um, for which Europe bears uh, uh, most of the responsibility and the political responsibility. So uh, I will focus on the European Union and on uh, uh, the European Union crisis. Um, and I apologize, apologize in advance because I think some of my anger and disgust will probably transpire from what I'm going to say. But I also think uh, that uh, anger is an important political feeling. Uh, an important political effect, effect, and I think we should keep uh, our capacity to get to uh, to be angry and disgusted and ashamed in front of these uh, events. Uh, so I want to focus on uh, some aspects of the European crisis, uh, and one of the reasons for this, and of course I only have two minutes, so I will only say very very basic uh, things about this. Uh, but one of the reasons for uh, why I want to focus on the European on the European uh, crisis uh, uh, produced by the refugee crisis uh, is that uh, a moment of crisis clearly is not just a moment of impasse or a moment of collapse or a regression. Uh, a moment of crisis is also a moment of transformation. So it, I think it is important to understand uh, in what directions uh, this crisis may evolve and what, uh, what, are the, uh, the, what are some of the stakes, at least, that are playing a role in the discussions uh, in uh, European executive uh, institutions. 
Um, and I'm insisting on the, on the uh, issue of transformation in the sense that I do, uh, and this is the thesis I'm going to support uh, today, I'm going to argue for, uh, because I do think that the refugee crisis, from the viewpoint of uh, uh, what I'm sorry to call the European technocrats, is not just uh, uh, a problem to be solved, but is actually also uh, an opportunity to uh, rediscuss and redefine the relations of force and the respective roles of uh, uh, European Union members within the European Union. And I will uh, refer to the Italian case, so what the Italian strategy, the Italian government strategy has been so far, uh, in order to, uh, to give an example of the way in which the refugee crisis is actually not just causing a problem, uh, it is clearly causing a problem, but it's also uh, giving, opening some uh, uh, opportunities uh, for some national governments to actually redefine and, and try to push to redesign uh, the, the profile of the European Union <coughs> and the respective roles within the European Union. Uh, so I will start from the impasse. Um, and just to give you an example of a, a sense of the impasse uh, uh, in a very few words, uh, over the course of a year, uh, there have been uh, 18 summits involving uh, the executive institutions of the European Union, so the European Council, the Council of the European Union, uh, the European Commission, uh, the uh, United Nations, and uh, also NATO. Uh, the outcome of these uh, 18 summits over the course of a year has been uh, the relocation of uh, about 600 refugees, 600. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as you may understand, the outcome has been absolutely ridiculous. Um, one of the stakes, of, of course, of these of this summits was to save, try to save Schengen, basically. So, try to save the Schengen Agreement. These summits uh, didn't manage to do this. Uh, the Schengen uh, Agreement, uh, Schengen has been suspended by a number of individual countries. Uh, the most recent uh, instance is uh, the suspension of, Je of Schengen at the a border between uh, uh, Austria and Italy, at the Brennero, um, by the Austrian government, which is causing a set of, a series of uh, tensions uh, uh, between the Italian government and the Austrian government. Um, the Belgian government uh, uh, suspended Schengen uh, at, the, at, the, at the border with France to prevent the migrants from Calais uh, to actually go back to Belgium to try to cross to the UK, and the examples can be multiplied. Um, the, Dublin, the Dublin agreement about the management of asylum seekers was never respected for various reasons, and I will uh, only offer you the Italian example once again because it's part of the strategy of the Italian government on this. Um, and actually some uh, serious discussions uh, have started about uh, uh, whether to suspend Schengen for two years, whether to replace Schengen with a mini Schengen involving only a few countries and leaving out uh, Italy, uh, Greece, and, uh, and East Europe, so the countries that were not complying with the Dublin Agreement. Um, and other uh, options are uh, still on the table and under discussion. So, so this, this is to give you, le let's say, the side of the impasse, in a sense. Although I do think that in the discussions about the Schengen Agreement, there is not just an impasse. There is, again, uh, there are different competing interests in redefining U the European Union in uh, different directions. Um, the main strategy adopted by the European Union so far, that has failed so far, uh, but we do not know whether it will, uh, and I say fail from the viewpoint again of the European governments, or the European technocrats, was the strategy of exter externalization of borders. So, so basically to again give a, a very short summary of what it, this means, it means to somehow decouple or separate the uh, European military borders from the political and geographical borders, uh, and to export the European military borders outside of the political borders of the European Union. How is this be, uh, has this been done? Through be, first of all, through bilateral agreements uh, between uh, the European Union or individual uh, members of the European Union and states outside, countries outside of the, of the European Union. One of the first of these agreements was the agreement between uh, Italy and Libya which fell apart because of the disintegration of Libya uh, following the uh, US military intervention. Um, the uh, European Union-Turkey agreement is part of this strategy. So in other words, the logic is, uh, is basically to pay more, you know, to have <coughs> economic agreements uh, with these countries, uh, countries of ori origin or countries of transit of uh, migrants and refugees to build fa uh, facilities, infrastructure, 
that is camp, uh, concentration camps, camps where uh, migrants are uh, detained, uh, funded with, with European Union money in order to keep them outside of the, of the European uh, Union borders. So they are the, the so-called hotspots. Um, they also uh, foresee military training, you know, military help, mili direct military help, mi military aid, but Frontex forces or by uh, the armies of the European uh, uh, countries to train um, uh, the, the military forces uh, in, uh, in the individual countries outside of Europe about how to manage the, the crisis, how to patrol the borders, and so on and so on. Now, this strategy so far has failed uh, for a number of reasons that uh, I don't have the time to discuss. Uh, however, the, I think the European and uh, European Turkey agreement is trying to actually relaunch this strategy. Um, and uh, just to give, uh, to summarize what this agreement is, it, it is an agreement uh, that uh, makes, le makes it legal, what is absolutely illegal, that is the mass deportation of uh, uh, refugee asylum seekers and uh, migrants from uh, uh, the hotspots in Greece back to Turkey, which is a country that doesn't respect uh, international law on asylum. Uh, so, so far for the impasse and for the attempts to actually make the strategy of the externalization of borders uh, work. Uh, but I want to give, finish uh, by giving you the example of uh, how all of this impasse has been used or is being used to try to redefine the relations of force within uh, Europe. And uh, the Italian case is for perhaps the most evident uh, case. So Italy has been doing two things. The, the first thing is that uh, um, it has violated systematically the Dublin Agreement. In other words, it has uh, facilitated the transit of uh, migrants coming from Africa to the Sicilian coast uh, throughout the country uh, toward the, the border with France and Austria. And why that, uh, has it done this? First of all, to, re to actually reopen the discussion of, on the Dublin Agreement, which requires the countries of arrival uh, of uh, refugees to actually register and detain and process the, the, uh, the, the request for asylum. Uh, but one of the reasons is actually was to create a problem. In other words, uh, uh, Italy has been, the, the Italian governments uh, have been negotiating, uh, uh, of, have been waging a low intensity war with, especially with Germany, about uh, the, the discussion of the debt and the management of the economic crisis. Uh, so that uh, the, the refugee crisis is actually one part of the, of the, of the strategy uh, of this low intensity war between the Italian government and the German government. Uh, to give a, a further example of this, which is the second thing that the Italian government is doing, uh, uh, today, uh, a discussion has started about a new proposal by the Italian government, um, which is called the, the Migration Compact. And the Migration Compact uh, would, be, would consist in the uh, application of the tenets of the agreement, uh, the main tenets of the agreement with Turkey, to other countries. So what Italy has in mind especially is especially countries in Africa, African countries. So in other words, the creation of hotspots in these countries, uh, European funds uh, used to create this camp, concentration camps uh, in these countries, uh, military training, military aid, and so on. Now, the, 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 the proposal has been welcomed by uh, uh, EU, EU members with one exception, uh, that uh, there is at the moment uh, uh, an argument between the Italian government and the German government about how to fund the project. And why is this the case? Because uh, Italy, so the government Renzi, has suggested, uh, has, and is insisting on this, that uh, uh, perhaps the European Central Bank or another institution should uh, uh, release uh, euro bonds to fund this project. In other, word, in other words, and uh, this discussion about euro bonds has been going on uh, between Italy and Germany for the last years. And, and there is, uh, so what is the point here is that uh, um, that uh, uh, the Italian government is trying to use the refugee crisis uh, and uh, the necessi necessity to, to, to find a solution to the refugee crisis to actually mutualize the debt. So in other words, uh, to issue, to, to push, to force the, the, the German government that has constantly refused to do so to issue, uh, to, to accept that uh, the European Central Bank will issue 
uh, will issue aero bonds, so joint bonds. Um, why is, the, uh, is Italy doing this? So on the one hand, because this goes in the direction of mutualizing the debt. And of course, this is favorable to the countries that are most indebted in, uh, within the European Union, and Italy is the most indebted, uh, besides Greece, <laughs> after Greece. <laughs> so. um, and the second reason is that uh, with this mechanism basically would uh, open uh, the European financial markets to, a set of Afri to, the, to the set of African countries that would participate in the agreement. Uh, and uh, I think that the re reasoning behind the uh, Italian government is basically that this may actually help uh, Italy to then acquire an international and financial profile, so as a main reference, reference, uh, reference point and interlocutor for the African countries that would participate in the agreement. So I'm giving this example just to, uh, just to give you precisely an idea of the horrifying <laughs> Uh, nature of the of the negotiation uh, about the refugees, where the point is not simply to manage millions of people who may arrive to Europe and so on. The point the, the point is really like what kind of interest are at stake in this uh, in this negotiation and uh, uh, and uh, and how this uh, this crisis can be used to actually either on the one hand to reassert and to confirm uh, the German hegemony within the European Union or to jeopardize on the one hand, the, the, the German hegemony in the European Union. So I will conclude with a more general point, and I, I will throw this as a provocation here, because I think um, there is, of course, a, a shared worry that uh, one of the reactions uh, to this European, uh, to this crisis, uh, may be that of, uh, you know, just coming back to national sovereignty, uh, to the to the, a strong uh, notion of, uh, of the national state, and what one can discuss whether this is actually a problem or not, um, and we may have different ideas about this. But I actually do not think, uh, on, although I do think, of course, this is one of the options on the table, so this may happen. Uh, but actually, I do not really think that uh, this is the most likely outcome of the, of the crisis, for, the reasons, uh, for some of the reasons I was explaining, it is that actually, uh, the interest stakes uh, um, have more to do about redesigning what, what the, the European Union is, leaving perhaps out some of the countries, including, excluding, and so on, uh, redesigning uh, a system of, of transnational governance, uh, more than uh, going back to simple national sovereignty and uh, internal borders. And uh, one of the simple reasons for this is that from an uh, economic viewpoint, so from the viewpoint of European capitalism, uh, the suspension of Schengen is a disaster. So, at least from the viewpoint of, of the big European uh, capitalism, the um, il sole 24 ore, which is the equivalent of uh, The Economist or the Wall Street Journal and so on in Italy, has been publishing articles uh, every single day, uh, attacking Austria in the last days for the suspension of uh, Schengen at the border with, with Italy. Just to go on, and, uh, you know, uh, giving quantifications of the economic damage that this, uh, that this uh, entails. Why? Because Schengen regulates not only the free circulation of citizens, but quite importantly, the free circulation of commodities and goods among the, among the, among the boundaries. So within this context, uh, just to conclude with a more general point, um, and a bit as a provocation, I would even say that uh, as I do not believe that, uh, that the most likely outcome is uh, to go back to national states. And as I do think that this European Union is uh, precisely the opposite of what uh, uh, um, an ideal Europe should look like, a un universalistic social Europe should, should look like. Uh, it is uh, somehow, in a sense, uh, a negation in, in, in reality of this idea. Um, I personally am reaching, increasingly reaching the, 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 the conclusion that uh, uh, a strong opposition to uh, this whole uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, framework uh, and, uh, uh, and to what the European Union is today is absolutely crucial, paradoxically enough, to save the dream or the ideal of a real uh, uh, European Union. Because what is happening today is that uh, uh, the, the way in which the unity of Europe has been achieved and has been realized uh, with also with the extreme lack of democracy. The European Parliament is playing absolutely no role in this, in this crisis, no role whatsoever. Uh, so the way in which this European Union has been implemented and acted is actually discrediting and delegitimizing any idea in the eyes of, uh, of citizens uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. 
any idea of uh, a real, uh, uh, you know, a real uni uh, unit of Europe. So I think that uh, one of the things we, things we should be clear about is that uh, when we define defend the, 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 the ideal of a uh, uh, transnational uh, uh, forms of uh, of, st of statual organization, uh, this is uh, this should be really considered in terms that are absolutely diametrically opposed to what is uh, happening now and what, uh, what and to what has been realized so far, which is uh, to sum up uh, with a single word, simply a shame. Thank you so much. <laughs> Clara Potigi is next. Okay, so I would like to um, take begin with uh, the, the the point where Chinsa left the discussion and perhaps push it at a more general and philosophical level. And I will do so by reading a text also to make sure I stay within my uh, ten minutes. So most of the debate, and I think uh, what I've heard so far uh, suggests is um, really revolves <laughs> around the issue whether the responsibility for handling the refugees crisis belongs to the European institution as a whole or whether it belongs to individual nation states and if the latter, which ones. I would like to suggest that actually this is a false alternative. In terms of citizenship, the European Union is dependent on the nation states that compose it and therefore as a political organization the European Union is still largely dependent on the logic of the nation states. But states, in particular European nation states, are in my view incapable of handling the crisis, the crisis precisely because they are the very source of it. So instead of asking how can Europe or European states solve the problem of the refugee, we should rather ask, can European state actually even do it? And the answer, as I already suggested, in my view is no. <laughs> European uh, states are unable to deal with the problem because uh, the European nation state as a, political, uh, as a political form of organization is the source of the problem. In order to understand why this is the case, let me try to begin with uh, an even more uh, fundamental question, which is why and how can uh, migration become a crime? Uh, how can it be that something that human beings have been doing on Earth since their appearance on this planet that is migrating all of a sudden started to be uh, possibly persecuted as a crime? Uh, and uh, this is currently the case not only in the US but also in most of the European uh, countries. Notice here also the anomaly created by European immigration law as the no one is illegal manifesto reminds us, immigration law is different from other types of law because under all other types of law is the act itself that is illegal. Whereas immigra in immigration law, it is the person who is illegal. So when you cross a border without proper documents, you are not simply doing something illegal, you are becoming illegal yourself. As a consequence, illegal uh, immigrants are uh, routinely and automatically dehumanized because they are reduced to the state of non-person. They exist outside of the law and therefore they exist, they exist outside of the law protection. Now, it's on the basis of conception of the law centered on the notion of personhood on the one hand and on the roundness of the earth on the other that Immanuel Kant uh, once tried to defend the idea of a cosmopolitan right of hospitality. I don't want to go that way. I don't want to uh, enter into the details of Kant philosophy, right? But I would like to draw attention to his central claim. Human beings are given the entire globe as their only possible dwelling, this is what Kant observe, so they cannot disperse in it infinitely because the earth itself is spherical. This also means that you cannot be denied entry in all and every country that you cross because it would end up precisely at the very same point where you began. This is what is happening now in Europe, and it's always pushing somewhere else. So according to Kant, this explains why human beings have the right to move on Earth and to try to enter in a friendly relationship with people living in other regions of the globe, 
And the latter, in their turn, they have a universal duty of hospitality. Now, notice that this duty of hospitality uh, simply means not treating them as enemies. Uh, this is Kant formulation, which translated in our terms means simply allowing them entry. Uh, it doesn't mean hang out with them, take them out for dinner. It simply means allowing entry. Now, Kant notoriously liked to present his theories in the form of a transcendental justification. Let's try to uh, unpack the format and see what happens if we adopt a more mundane empirical perspective. So since the very first appearance of that animal species called Homo sapiens, humans have constantly been moving from one land to another. Uh, how did it happen that such a tendency could become persecuted as a crime up to the point that doing so turns the people themselves into illegal as such? Mm. Now, humans have always been migrating, but have not always been living under sovereign nation states. Uh. Rather, if you look at it in a historical perspective, the modern system of uh, uh, sovereign states cannot but appear as a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, it began in Europe, sometimes during the 16th or perhaps, according to other uh, interpreters, the 17th century, and it was ratified, according to uh, the common view, by the 1648 Peace of Westphalia. Uh, so, 1648, and uh, it's not that long time ago. Now, what are the consequences of this? First, the sovereign state is not an a priori of human life, but a contingent historical phenomenon which appears at some point in history. There's no a priori reason to suppose that it's going to be there forever. Second, its history can actually be located in a very specific time and place, huh? European modernity. So there's no, again, a priori reason to suppose that the way it worked in Europe, and well, it was a good thing for Europe, should work equally well elsewhere. Now, this second point is particularly relevant for us because, as, as you notice, most of the debate around migration tends to take the presupposition of a world of sovereign state as unquestioned. But should, this, is, this at least is my view, this should not be the case first and foremost because it has not always been the case. As many theories of international relations have been pointing out, it's time to dispel the myth of the Westphalian system. That is, to dispel the idea that the framework of a world divided into nation states should be the default um, form of organization of our political space. Actually, the organization of the globe in such a system, which implies a, a system of state each claiming sovereign authority within a specific territory and with the consequent system of clear-cut boundaries, uh, not only began in Europe, but also remained there for a relatively long time. Um, we can say at least it remained there until 1945, which is the moment when the decolonization movement um, other, uh, the entire globe started to be divided in nation states. Between 1648 and the Second World War, most of the earth live under empires. Huh? Now, empires did not have that many virtues, but uh, on the other hand, they had porous boundaries. Uh, Boundaries that were much more flexible than those uh, implied by the idea of a world all divided into uh, sovereign states. Now, do we have to keep uh, thinking about the world in terms of uh, sovereign states? And even if it, it doesn't prove to be possible uh, to envisage alternative uh, uh, forms of organization here and now, can we not think of a forms of statehood with porous boundaries? Huh? So, to sum up uh, what I've been trying to say up to now, I think the idea of a world fully divided into sovereign state is not only an historical phenomena, but also a very recent one, and one which has proved uh, not to be working particularly well, particularly outside of Europe. 
its incapacity to handle the refugees crisis and the migration of our time, I think is just one among the fa many failed uh, promises of the sovereign state. Yet we are so caught up in the model of the sovereign state that we keep discussing and di disputing within its logic as if it were the only one possible. This is my land, this is your land, this is my country, this is your country, we were here before, you arrived later. In doing so, in all this questioning, we tend to forget that the only thing that we can actually claim to be ours, in the sense that we cannot be outside of it, is the earth. Eh? Nothing more, but also nothing less. There are a lot of different possibilities on how to organize our living on Earth, which is not necessarily a system, the Westphalian system of sovereign states. So we live, however, in a context where it seems impossible to even make the argument that people should be allowed to freely circulate. Yet, there are people who believe this. There, is, there are numerous campaigns for the abolition of the crime of clandestine immigration. Huh? If undocumented immigration were not a crime, there would be no need for deten detention centers, no clashes between migrants and the police, no human smugglers, and perhaps also a bit less racism. People could go simply where they want to go, and as a matter of fact, people are usually smart enough to go to places where they have a chance of a decent life. Writing in 1891, an Italian political theorist wrote, in France, there has existed for centuries an institution, la louveterie, something almost, almost impronounceable, uh, which is an institution entrusted with the task of destroying wolves hunting the French territory. No one will be surprised to learn that this is just because this institution existed in France and it existed for such a long time that there are still wolves in France and that in exceptional cases, they really wreak havoc, end quote. So at a time when wolves had ceased to be a problem everywhere in Europe, they still were a problem in France. Uh, in the rest of Europe, wolves had been demonized, so you know, they were no, no longer the problem, so they could simply freely circulate, but they were still a problem in France where there was the institution, la louveterie, for the extermination of wolves. Similarly, we can think that migration problems exist because police uh, on the borders uh, exist. No louveterie, no wolf. No border control, no border problems, which also means no need to invest millions of euros in building walls, which is what Hungary is doing and uh, many other European countries are thinking of doing. No detention centers where migrants are forced to live in exasperating conditions. No routine shipwrecks in the Mediterranean and also no human smugglers who at times turn into human traffic, uh, traffickers and therefore really uh, play havoc and become themselves dangerous wolves. Coming to the conclusion, so according to many estimates, and at the moment he, when we are here speaking, there are currently approximately 55,000 refugees and asylum seekers who are blocked in Greece uh, which they had expected to be just a country of passage. Uh, but they are blocked there because according to the Dublin uh, regulation, um, invented, by the way, to prevent people from asking asylum in more than one country, uh, they have to ask asylum in their first country of entry, uh, in their first entry point into the European Union. Now, obviously, for a country like Greece, this creates huge problems. Where to host them, how to feed them, how to support them, how to make sure they don't escape. But if the Dublin regulations were not there, and if the other refugees' laws that uh, prevent them from moving were not there, the problem would not be there. These people would naturally have gone to the countries and spaces that could, where they could stand a chance of living. Therefore, probably moving to some other uh, European uh, northern country, 
which have a much stronger welfare state and certainly not, will not be stuck in countries like Greece and Italy which are themselves uh, struggling uh, economically. So to conclude, the problem is, my, in my view, is not uh, how to handle the refugees crisis, nor for that matter, how to uh, handle migration more in general. The point is rather to overturn the logic that made of it a problem to begin with. Uh, human beings that lived outside of their logic for most of our recorded history. I mean, this is an historical uh, banal fact. So maybe getting into that logic was not a good idea in the first place. Perhaps times has come to reconsider that logic as a whole. And last but not least, whether we are willing to reconsider that logic or not, we as you know, political theorists sitting here with our visa uh, in our pockets, this is what migrants, as we speak here, are, whether we want it or not, doing all the time on all the borders around the world. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so I want to turn um, the theoretical focus to the other meaning of refugee movements and look at the political significance of um, the movement of refugees, both in the sense of political movements, but also in the sense of understanding the act of crossing the border and especially understanding the act of irregularly crossing the border as a political act. So I'll focus on a specific aspect of what is sometimes called border struggles, so struggles that take place at the border, not only now after migration has taken place, we are all familiar with migrant movements, um, organized uh, refugee movements, for example, in Berlin or in Amsterdam, where you have a lot of uh, groups of uh, migrants and refugees that claim uh, political agency and kind of a voice in, 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 in the public sphere. But what is new, I think, and what is really interesting is that this mobilization now takes place at the border um, itself. And this is manifested in a lot of um, pictures that you have seen in recent weeks where um, refugees and other migrants who are crossing the border irregularly are holding up signs um, which make clear the political aspect, the political intention even, of that act of crossing the border. They have signs which say open the borders, they have signs uh, claiming human rights, rights to freedom of movement, etc. So that, and that's, I think, a qualitatively new uh, development in the politicization of migration uh, that we have seen since um, this so-called crisis has um, erupted in, um, in, in the last uh, year and a half. Um, so I want to ask the question whether irregular or what would be more correctly called irregularized migration, because I agree with Chiara that migration itself um, is never irregular in itself per se, it's uh, irregularized. The status it has is a status that states usually impose on migration. Um, and I want to ask whether irregularized migration can be fruitfully understood as a form of disobedience or even as a form of civil um, or civic disobedience. And I think this question is actually useful despite maybe you know, its counterintuitive character because it lets us see something about the act of migration that we might otherwise miss, namely its political potential, but it also tells us something about the inadequacy of established understandings of civil disobedience that uh, we find in the public debate where civil disobedience is only exercised by agents who are already recognized as citizens by these states. But that's clearly inadequate, and I think um, in order to understand the political um, potential of uh, forms of migration that we've recently witnessed, it's, um, it's actually useful to think of them in terms of civil disobedience. Um, also for epistemic reasons, I mean, this concept looking at migration through the lens of civil disobedience also shows, I think, something that we often repress, namely the, ins the uncivil nature of the existing border regime. So also something that the first two interventions have highlighted. So by looking at the civility of um, these acts of irregularized border crossing, we can also see the incivility of the existing border regime. Now I think that the incivility, or maybe in less normatively loaded terms, the illegitimacy of the existing border regime is in a way Overdetermined. Um, it's overdetermined because it's illegitimate um, according to a variety of um, standpoints. So I think it's clearly at the moment illegitimate 
for humanitarian reasons. I mean, Chinsia has pointed out that um, you know every day, every week, people are dying in huge numbers in the Mediterranean and other places as well. We should not only focus um, at those who drown uh, at sea, but there are also other kinds of deaths that migrants suffer from um, in lorries, trains, etc., airplanes. Um, so this is one aspect in which I think the illegitimacy and the incivility of the border regime is more and more becoming evident and more difficult to suppress. Um, it's also, um, I think, illegitimate from a legal point of view, as the UNHCR and other UN agencies have pointed out, and as I think Chinsia also has um, pointed out, the uh, current agreement between the EU and Turkey um, probably asks states to violate their obligations under international law, and is from this point of view, which is not a very revolutionary one, uh, illegitimate. Um, it's also illegitimate from more radical political point of views, obviously, that would argue um, you know, against the uh, authority of states to just um, unilaterally control uh, freedom of movement across borders. Um, and this is a point that I think is, is actually important because we should point out that from a normative point of view, from a philosophical or theoretical point of view, um, the reasons that are usually given for justifying the state's right to control access to its own territory, these, norm th these normative reasons are very weak. And um, I think the normative reasons that problematize such a right of states to regulate uh, migration, they're actually quite strong. And I just want to point out three arguments that um, we can sort of differentiate in the normative philosophical debate, which I think together at least show that um, states probably don't have a right to regulate access to the territory as they do um, in their current form. The first argument is an argument from distributive justice. Um, um, it, it simply points out that the fact that someone is born on the other side of the border um, does in reality have an incredibly uh, large effect on that person's chances to lead you know, a good life or a minimally decent life. Um, but it shouldn't have that effect. It shouldn't depend on contingencies of where you happen to be born whether you can lead such a life or not. But that's what, as a matter of fact, determines people's life chances today. Um, and the existing border regime is cementing these injustices. It even keeps us from seeing them because it naturalizes this idea that, you know, it's just that's just how it is. Some are born in Germany and others are born um, in you know, all the other countries that people try to uh, flee from. Um, as Joseph Kerens has argued, this is analogous to feudal privilege. It's a not... It's, it's unjustifiable that this kind of contingency has these effects. Um, another argument against, from a normative point of view, against the existing border regime is an argument from freedom of movement. Um, in almost all states, freedom of movement is recognized as a constitutional and even basic human right within these states. Um, but I think the same considerations that speak for you know, recognizing freedom of movement within nation states also speak for recognizing it across nation states. Um, there's absolutely no reason to think that in all cases people's claim to move freely can be sort of satisfied within, again, the contingent confines of the nation state they happen to be born in. So why, would, why should we accept um, states' claim that they can just, without giving any reasons actually, uh, limit people's freedom of movement in the ways in which they do? Um, a third argument that uh, we can see in the normative debate argue, is an argument from democratic legitimacy. <coughs> Um, borders um, have an incredible effect on the people that they hinder from migrating and entering. And as uh, Arash Abizadeh has shown, I think convincingly in a series of articles, um, that would usually, let's say normal understandings of democratic legitimacy actually mean that these states have to um, you know, somehow not only justify themselves towards those they are coercing with their border policies, but actually somehow involve them in the process of decision making. Usually those who are subject to coercive laws have political standing, not just standing as a moral subject, but political standing. But most migrants who are directly affected by, for example, the border laws of the European Union have absolutely no say. It's totally clear in how these uh, laws come to be and how they are um, exercised. So from all these different perspectives, I think, um, um, it's clear that the existing border regime in general, but in particular the one enforced by the European Union at the moment, is illegitimate from this variety of normative perspectives, but, but also, as I said, uh, from the humanitarian 
and more limited um, legal perspective. Now, I think that um, this gives us sort of strong reasons to think that irregular migration can be justified as a kind of resistance and disobedience in the face of that illegitimate border regime. And I think it also gives you know, people who are citizens of these states reasons to actually assist those who try to cross borders irregularly in uh, doing so. Um, now, what does it add to look at irregularized migration through the lens of civil disobedience? Um, as I said, I think it, it helps us see the political uh, potential or the political dynamic of migration movements that challenge the kind of naturalized um, legitimacy assumptions that we usually subscribe to, where nation states just have the right to regulate access. I try to, uh, I try to show why this is a very implausible assumption. I think the fact that people um, en masse violate this claim, as a matter of fact, through their irregularized migration can help to expose that usually naturalized assumption. So I think it's a, it's a case of disobedience which turns our attention to a problem that we usually um, don't really um, take seriously. So it, it has a kind of denaturalizing effect, which is, I think, one of the, um, you know, also kind of classical roles that civil disobedience plays in other uh, contexts. It's, it's, it's trying to force, um, as Martin Luther King already argued, it's trying to force a public to pay attention to a problem that it would rather just ignore in order to continue with um, its daily business. And I think in that sense, um, irregularized migration can play um, a similar role. But as I said, it also teaches us something about um, how to change our, our established <coughs> understanding of civil disobedience. I think um, we should reconsider uh, that idea of civil disobedience in three dimensions with regard to the agents of civil disobedience, with regard to their practices, and with regard to their aims. And I just end by saying quickly what I mean with that. So um, with regard to the agents, I think it's clear. I mean, these forms of civil disobedience, if you want to think of them that way, they're not exercised by agents who are already recognized as citizens. They are precisely um, engaged in by those who have no political or even moral standing in the current configuration. So in that sense, they are much more radical, I think, than established forms of civil disobedience in which citizens engage. Um, then, again, the practices that make up these forms of disobedience at the border are, I think, really new. I mean, they, they even uh, are different, I think, and innovative um, in comparison with earlier refugee activism, for example, in the case of the Sans Papier in Paris. I mean, that was ex post activism, which is you know, not to say that it's somehow uninteresting or bad or anything, but this is a new, qualitatively new phenomenon, I think, that we are seeing today. So the practice itself is transformed. And, and finally, with regard to the aim, I think what we can learn from looking at irregularized migration as civil disobedience is that this kind of disobedience can be pretty radical. You know, I mean, what is happening is not, is not that um, irregularized migrants sort of ask for local changes in how uh, a system that is generally recognized as legitimate works. No, what they are doing is to actually call the fundamental legitimacy of that question, of that system, into question and to actually ask for a fundamental revision of the basic rules of that system in terms of freedom of movement, in terms of um, global justice, but also maybe in terms of some kind of transnational and to a certain extent maybe utopian, that's where I think my comment links with Chiara's uh, certain form of utopian understanding of transnational um, democracy that is already enacted in the way in which uh, these movements take place uh, today. Thanks. So yes, um, uh, I'm not going to say something very different from what has been said. Uh, um, a few maybe uh, des descriptive observations and if there is time, uh, uh, some kind of theoretical or political investigations about the current situation. So. A very um, uh, disparate uh, uh, observations. Um, can, we can start with the question, what's wrong uh, with Europe? Although it shouldn't be limited to Europe, but to the global north. But let's say, what's wrong with Europe? To understand what's going on in Europe, um, uh, one can start with a counterfactual comparison. Uh, when uh, uh, the Germans, in particular, let's say Merkel, uh, insisted on imposing uh, this uh, new austerity uh, project um, in Europe uh, after the, the financial crisis, uh, nobody uh, uh, challenged her. 
her position even her popularity increased. When uh, she uh, took the position about uh, refugees, uh, uh, almost uh, she was uh, overthrown. So in other words, uh, uh, both uh, the political European elite uh, and the public opinion, in a sense, uh, sided with Merkel when it came to the austerity politics, uh, but when it came to the refugees, uh, they abandoned her. And I think, uh, imagine it was the, the other way. Merkel uh, supporting the refugees and having the support of Europe and of politicians, and Merkel supporting the austerity and being abandoned by her allies. <laughs> That, I think, will, says a lot about how Europe, uh, what's happening to Europe. Now, uh, I'm not uh, uh, the second observation. This is what's happening now in Europe with the refugees. Uh, it's not uh, uh, something new. We shouldn't be really surprised about what has been happening in the, in the last one year. It has been in the making of after the, the end of the Cold War. Uh, it's a post-Cold War phenomenon that uh, for the, th the last 25 years uh, had already started. Uh, uh, the numbers were there. It's what uh, we see, it's a culmination of a process uh, that uh, is almost uh, synonymous and uh, coeval of uh, the Europe emerging after the, the, end, uh, the, the, the end of the Cold War and uh, the creation of the, of the new Europe. So, uh, It is part of the 90s, it's part of the 2000, it has a long trajectory. It's not, things, it's not, it's not, it's not something new. Uh, the third element um, that also one uh, has to take in, uh, into account is uh, the way uh, one uh, evaluates uh, uh, Europe in general. Uh, again, nothing to be surprised uh, given uh, the uh, history uh, of modern Europe. Uh, I'm surprised, uh, on the contrary, when I hear that uh, there are some ideals that Europe has to, I don't know, redeem uh, by taking the correct position on the so-called refugee uh, question. Uh, xenophobia, racism, uh, exclusion, nationalism is constitutive of the European identity. So we shouldn't really be shocked or ashamed by something that has been happening for centuries. Nationalism, not only the state, but nationalism uh, uh, has been created by Europe. So uh, to say, to, to, to think about redeeming uh, uh, the universalist European dream is simply to try to redeem uh, the Eurocentric core of that dream for the Europeans and the nightmare for the others. So uh, let's think more about this. The fourth point, uh, observation, is that we focus on the refugees. And uh, this uh, creates, I think, um, uh, an obscurity, obscures uh, the question of the irregular migrants. Uh, we have forgotten about the irregular migrants. Everybody focuses on, on the refugees, and uh, uh, the, the future of, uh, of a political struggle should include both categories, uh, rather than privileging the one uh, against the other and turn the one against the other, or uh, putting all resources, attention, strategies, politics on the refugees. This is an artificial administrative uh, distinction. Uh, whether one and the, another uh, additional observation is who is a refugee uh, in the long Western uh, tra modern tradition of political theory from let's say Baudin on the refugee always has been uh, uh, equated with someone who flees oppression and persecution is the sub the subject who flees who runs away. It's, uh, it, used, it, it used to be formulated in the traditional classical uh, political-theoretical language uh, as uh, a, a passive, uh, passive uh, disobedience. So, uh, and uh, when we adopt this term, uh, we are reproducing uh, this uh, uh, depolitization and uh, a negative connotation of the subject. The refugee as someone who flees. Uh, and uh, as also um, um, it has been said by Robin and others, I want to emphasize now uh, maybe what I consider to be uh, the culmination of this uh, uh, event that have been developing uh, for uh, many decades uh, in what uh, we are witnessing um, in uh, the borders. Uh, I don't remember any time in the uh, history of modern European states, uh, and perhaps not only there, where uh, uh, clashes, violent clashes, I'm not speaking about civil disobedience, uh, I'm speaking about uh, uncivil acts of disobedience, cl clashes between uh, uh, refugees uh, or irregular migrants uh, with uh, activists, uh, let's call them native European native activists, uh, against uh, border police uh, and uh, uh, national armies. This has happened uh, in uh, the borders in uh, Greece and Macedonia. It, ha it happened in the Hungarian borders. It had already happened in the Calais many, uh, several years ago. So never before 
to my knowledge, with a few exceptions uh, in divided cities, Berlin and uh, Nicosia and Cyprus, did we see uh, violent clashes not between two combatant armies, but between spontaneous, unorganized movements from below and uh, uh, border patrols uh, or national armies. This is, in a, in, in a sense, uh, what may uh, define and determine the political struggles of the future. It will not be any more about redistributionist politics, uh, economic equality among uh, a given citizens, uh, but uh, rather it will be about uh, the meaning uh, of boundary differences, uh, distinctions, exclusions uh, that define who is uh, within a political community, what is a political community, and what is outside. This, uh, uh, I, I take it to be the beginning of a new type of politics uh, that will define the global north, maybe also the global south. If one w w looks at what is happening in Africa, in South Africa, uh, in uh, the Middle East, uh, with uh, uh, the mobility uh, of migrants all around the globe. Now, what that will mean for the so-called uh, European left? Uh, I might use a decisionistic language, because I think decisionism uh, is important uh, as a political language and political practice. A decision has to be made for the so-called European left. Either they will stand with the migrants, irregular refugees, and fight with them on the borders against their own native police and patrols, or the right will take the initiative that already is taken, because this is the most privileged place for the right to rediscover itself, nationalism, xenophobia, cultural identities, and uh, the whole European project will go back to the 1930s. In other words, the world historical task of the so-called European left is to side with an internationalist project from below that it, cannot, that it has not invented, it has not led, but it can side with and give it more organized solidarity and form. So this is the decision with whom you are. Where do you stand? With the, these movements, or against. And I'm saying this in relation to the so-called social democratic left. Social democracy, not only at the level of the political elite, has sided with the discourse of the right and the extreme right, and this we have seen it since the 80s and the 90s, but there is a deeper logic of why this has happened. One is the historical. Social democracy emerges in the moment where the communist and socialist movement splits between internationalists and socialists. 1914, joining the First World War for the nation. This is the birth moment of social democracy, the nationalist turn that still haunts it. The second important point is that social democracy is predicated on redistributing the privilege, economic, social, cultural, political, within a very specified homogeneous group of nationals. A kind of um, um, club. So every European country has its own club that citizens with legal rights enjoy. So the, the migrant comes, the refugee, the irregular, and poses a problem. How are we going to redistribute our nice pie among uh, all these poor wretched of, of the earth? So the, the logic of social democracy is endemically and politically and historically complicit and implicated in the nationalist resurgence, resurgence that we see in Europe today. So the left, in other words, either will, require, will assume its own internationalist, old, radical identity, or the, game, the political game is lost for the next decades. And when uh, in Europe the um, uh, left, the right, comes to power on a nationalist project, we know where it ends up. So it's more than uh, the simple European project. So what uh, might be... Uh, what ideas we can um, um, uh, conclude uh, uh, if this kind of uh, diagnosis uh, has any, any validity. The first uh, is to reconceptualize the geopolitics uh, of uh, struggle. It cannot be domestic uh, between, let's say, national classes. It has to be transnational and uh, beyond the transversal of Europe itself. It cannot be about Europe anymore. Uh, let's save Europe, let's save the values of Europe. It has to be more than that. It has to do with transnational uh, politics. The second is that uh, the struggles uh, on the borders, at the borders, uh, that politicize something that 
was only politicized from above, from the state, the borders were the privileged political side of the state, can be now repoliticized from below. And this can be done with the idea or the concept of a stateless citizen. A citizen who does not have a national loyalty and can fight on different borders, different times, with different collectivities that share the same views about breaking up these walls, these borders. Uh, again, someone might say the walls are like, um, uh, the borders are like prison walls. Um, and might appear a little bit romantic or excessive. Uh, actually, this is what Hobbes says himself uh, in the Leviathan, that uh, uh, the, the borders are like uh, protective walls for the sovereign to protect its subjects and for the subjects to give obedience to the sovereign. So it's already uh, 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 pre-announced pre in the old classical modern political uh, thought. Uh, and the last uh, uh, point, uh, just to, to, to conclude, uh, we cannot anymore fool ourselves uh, about the, the futures, uh, the political uh, struggles of the future. Uh, the, the main cleavage between right and left uh, is uh, the cleavage around migration, membership, uh, collective identity, and participation in collectivities. It, it, cannot, it, it will not be uh, anything else. And in that sense, as I see it, uh, although I'm not extremely optimistic about uh, the only solution in a rational, uh, from a rational point of view, the more radical, extreme the left becomes, uh, the more hope uh, there will be politically. The less radical it is, we are moving all into the extreme right. This, I see the uh, feature uh, cleavage uh, that is taking place right now in front of us. Thank you. myself very much in agreement with uh, Andreas and everyone else on this panel, so it's actually a very uncontroversial <laughs> event. Uh, all I can do is uh, maybe just to uh, re-emphasize some of the points uh, that have already been made. Uh, I want to start with um, quoting a thinker that is very often quoted in these debates about uh, migration and uh, refugees, uh, Hannah Arendt. Uh, Hannah Arendt has written uh, an article in 1943 in a, a small uh, Jewish uh, periodical entitled uh, We Refugees, refugees. Yeah. Uh, and in this article she uh, describes uh, that uh, many of the Jews who had fled uh, from Nazi Germany to the United States did not want to call themselves uh, refugees. Um, they had lost everything in, uh, in Europe um, and they were very eager to adapt um, to their new home, wanted to um, become citizens of, uh, of uh, this new state as quickly as possible. Um, and Hannah Arendt uh, thought uh, this was a mistake um, because she thought it was exactly uh, the model of the nation state that had produced statelessness and displaced person as a, uh, as a mass phenomenon in the first place. So she so she thought it would be um, short-sighted to simply see uh, the refugee status as a deficiency, as a problem, and the status of the citizen as the norm that should be regained as quickly as possible. Instead, she said uh, refugees should remember what made them special precisely as refugees. Um, and she uses this formulation that refugees are the vanguard of their people. Um, uh, because refugees have already actually already accomplished something what the, uh, the others not, have not yet accomplished, namely uh, freedom from a nation state. Uh, and in my short uh, statement, I just want to reflect on what that might mean for us today. Um, Georgia Gumbin uh, has, 50 years later, taken up uh, uh, Arendt's um, suggestion and uh, her analysis. Um, and I believe Agamben's uh, argument is very simple uh, in a way. Uh, Agamben has argued that uh, in modernity or the modern nation state rests on the assumption of a continuity between birth and citizenship, between uh, nativity and nationality. If you're born in the territory of, an, of a nation state, then Normally, um, you're granted citizenship in that nation state, and therefore you also gain protection of that state. Um, so there's this fiction of a continuity between birth and nation, 
Um, and but uh, at least since uh, the beginning of the 20th century, um, there have been a growing number of uh, stateless and displaced persons challenging this notion of the continuity between birth and, uh, and, and the nation state um, on a very fundamental level. Th these are people, stateless people, displaced persons who can no longer be represented within this uh, nexus of nativity and nation state. And uh, Agamben, most of you probably know this, and he, he, he uh, predicts that uh, states will manage, will try to uh, solve this pro problem by or try to manage this problem by localize these people uh, who can no longer be represented within the nation state and to create spatial forms of states of exceptions um, that he calls camps. Um, I don't want to go into the details of Agamemnon's analysis and I know that um, the accuracy of his uh, analysis are very much a debate. I don't want to debate about these theoretical points now. I'm just going to say that I think that um, the basic points of his analysis have been proven correct. Um, I believe that uh, if we look, I mean, and many on this panel have made this point already, that if you look at the Mediterranean, how Frontex, uh, the EU Border Protection Agency, acts in the Mediterranean, if you look at the camps in uh, Idomeni and uh, Lesbos, um, there is something going on like that. Um, uh, Frontex, for example, acts as a temporary sovereign uh, um, beyond the 12-mile uh, zone in the Mediterranean. Um, these refugees that are subject to um, these acts have no possibility to, um, to legal protection whatsoever. They are only the objects of sovereign action. They're never uh, the subjects of the law. Um, so instead of discussing uh, this in more detail, if the government is right or not, I just want to um, ask the question, given this situation that we are in right now, what does it mean to take seriously Arendt's uh, proposal to uh, rethink uh, the central categories of the political uh, based on the experience of refugees? Um, and, I mean, there is obviously no reason to uh, romanticize um, or to glorify uh, the experience of refugees. Uh, most of the refugees are probably would be very happy to gain the citizenship status um, and to uh, enjoy the rights and the privileges that comes with uh, such status. Um, but I still believe that if we take seriously uh, Arendt's uh, insight that nations, the nation state, na nation state produced this a situation in the first place, then we have to realize that the solution for this problem can never simply um, consist in uh, integration or in inclusion. The, the solution for exclusion is not inclusion. Um, that is something I think we can we can learn um, from uh, from Arendt, because if we think that we should overcome this current horrific situation simply by including everyone in the nation state as Maybe the early Merkel, uh, still the Merkel of uh, 2015, uh, still believed. Um, then we still adhere to this fiction of the necessary continuity between birth and the nation state, and we still think the refugee status as a problem and the citizenship status as the normality. And thereby, we reproduce um, the uh, um, uh, the catastrophic logic of this um, of this uh, fiction. Um, the Merkel's or the Merkel of 2015's talk of integration, admission, and so on always already assumed uh, Belastungsgrenze, a very famous word in German, a limit of burden. Um, a, a limit, uh, it always reproduces this logic of exclusion um, uh, and thereby is not, uh, does not go far enough. I, I also believe, and this might be a little bit more corrective point, that. Um, Another solution that is very popular among leftists uh, is also not sufficient, namely uh, the solution to uh, fight the causes for flight. Um, that is something that many leftists always say that, um, yeah, we cannot solve the problems um, uh, uh, at the border. We have to fight the causes why people are leaving um, their home in the first place. And I think uh, even though this is based on a very true 
uh, analysis, namely that it is the North and the West that have produced these causes for flight, uh, for example, by humanitarian so-called humanitarian interventions, wars, uh, ecological destruction, economic policies, and so on, I still believe that it is uh, short-sighted to simply say that we should fight the causes for flight because then we are also assuming that it would be best if everybody stayed in their place and uh, we would still uh, continue and perpetuate this fiction of birth and territoriality. Um, so all three uh, solutions, fortification, integration, and fighting the cause for flight, have the same problem, namely they, uh, they perpetuate this modern logic and that I think according to, at least according to uh, Arendt's insight and the government's actualization, uh, caused these very problems. Um, uh, and therefore, I, uh, and this is problematic for two reasons, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, for structural reasons, um, the division of the globe in, uh, and uh, Chiara has already talked about this, is the division of the globe in uh, nation states and the division of humanity into different peoples, by definition, uh, prolong exclusion, by definition, make people illegal. So uh, it has to, this, this logic has to be attacked on that level. And another point, the second point, also something that Arendt has already seen, is that it was only with the monopolization of force that is characteristic for the modern nation state um, comes the technological possibilities that we, can, that we see playing out against refugees right now. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the decision of the EU uh, Council of Ministers from uh, last May 2015, you find um, measures like uh, the fight uh, of illegal uh, immigration by warships, submarines, drones, helicopters, satellites, and communication centers, uh, to even come up with such sophisticated <coughs> measures to fight uh, 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 migration is something that is, comes only comes about because uh, uh, violence in the society is concentrated in the state apparatuses. Um, and thereby, if we accept these very um, state uh, violent forces, then we will always uh, have the problem that, um, that such technologies will be produced. Therefore, um, all three uh, so, uh, uh, solutions or responses to the refugee movements are not only futile, but also latently um, catastrophic. So instead of doing that, instead of uh, holding on to this uh, uh, fiction of a continuity between nation and nationality, uh, between, between nativity and nationality, we should rethink the, uh, the fundamental concepts of the political altogether. Uh, Arendt, uh, as most of you know, has coined this very famous phrase of the right to have rights. Um, uh, uh, people have the right to be member of a political community, to participate in the social practices of such a community. But at the same time, Arendt has, already, has also uh, 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 formulated this insight that such a community cannot consist in a nation state. So this leaves us with a task to think of uh, forms of political community that are different from nation states uh, uh, to invent forms of the democracy of political community of self governance um, beyond the nation state. Um, so, and, and to, to push this even further, I think uh, that that means that instead of uh, the refugees becoming citizens again, uh, being reabsorbed into this. Uh, uh, normal order of the nation state, um, it means that we have to reorganize the states uh, to better correspond to this fundamental a-territoriality of the human condition. Um, what does that mean concretely? Uh, I just want to very quickly name three points that I think uh, uh, can lead us uh, um, in rethinking the, these conceptions of the political one is um, the project of multiple citizenships. It should be uh, possible for people to be uh, members of, um, of uh, multiple political communities um, as well as uh, uh, be a member of a political community that is 
not in the same place as one is, uh, to relate to another a political community, even though it is not uh, 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 based on, on the territori territori <coughs> territorial area that one finds oneself in. Uh, the second is the need for a transnational public sphere. Um, I believe that the internet or the uh, um, technological solutions that the internet provide uh, give us uh, very good circumstances um, to do that, uh, to find a transnational way of communicating, also transnational way of decision making. And uh, last but not least, and maybe the most important point is um, to experiment with, point with um, models of interlegality and legal pluralism. Uh, it should be possible for multiple legal uh, orders to ex coexist in the same terri uh, uh, territorial area. Um, it, we need to, uh, the international law dis discussion uh, is already um, very much and very intensely discussing how this could look like, how uh, multiple legal orders could deal with um, uh, <coughs> possible collisions and conflicts, norm conflicts. Um, there's no reason why we should only talk about this on the level of international law and not also on the law uh, on the national level or on the level of local and uh, uh, and um, on, on, of local communities. Um, I just want to uh, end with a more political point. Um, I'm not against uh, reformism. I think that um, those who are in solidarity with uh, migrants and refugees struggles should do whatever is in their means to uh, to express this solidarity. That means, uh, first of all, provide food and shelter, uh, work, communication, fight against uh, the illegalization of migration, fight against uh, the uh, further fortification of the uh, of the border regime, uh, fight against administrative and police chicaneries and harassment and so on. I think that this is all is very important, but um, I also really um, very strongly believe that uh, given this current situation that uh, the left cannot remain reformist, um, be simply because if this is true, that global immigration is not going to go away. Um, this will be simply the part of our political reality for the next centuries. Um, uh, and at the same time, the uh, current political institutions are not capable of dealing with this um, in, a, in, a, in a way that does not lead to a humanitarian crisis. If this, both of these assumptions are true, then we are confronted with a, a very serious alternative, uh, namely either to uh, resolutely overcome the current political institutions or to face a, a new global catastrophe. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry that I had to be that guy who interrupts everyone. What uh, uh, the time lines. timeline. Thank you so much, all of you, for um, sharing your reflections on the political, the moral, the humanitarian, the social and political dimensions of this crisis. Uh, and even if there hasn't been so much of a disagreement, there have been all these various uh, dimensions and perspectives from which you uh, spelled this out. In order to bring a bit more of a disagreement into this discussion and opening up the floor right now, we have 40 minutes for discussion roughly. Nancy. A great panel. Thanks so much for organizing it and for um, sharing these perspectives. I have to say, however, um, I'm, I think that it would have been great to have an American perspective here. Not only because in the most immediate sense, we are probably the cause in the, in the sort of the sense of the efficient cause with the destabilization of the whole Middle East by our insane uh, foreign policy. Um, and somehow um, the uh, sense that we have any obligation here <laughs> is just obscured in a way. Um, I don't mean just by you, but by the whole way it's becoming your account. Um, but also, um, because we are um, you know, a, a country for whom uh, historically a natality and nationality do not coincide. 
And I think, in a sense, we are the proof of the pudding that thinking that that is the, the nub of the issue is too simple. Um, it seems to me that, um, that what's missing here in the discussion is the problem of capitalism. It, I, would, I would say that the Arendtian diagnosis is not simply that the, the nation state necessarily produces um, exclusion, and creates inclusion, and produces exclusion. But I think it, it, it would be better to say that um, it's the superimposition of a multi-state international system on an economic system which is constantly pushing beyond borders and which has an inherent expansionist drive, which is why I think her, her most important work here is that middle section on imperialism in the origins of totalitarianism. So, I mean, um, I'm really, you know, sort of moved by the level of indignation and by the level of um, desire for a radical politics. But I think that in order to get anywhere with this really, it becomes too much an empty gesture of radicalism. Better than the opposite, but um, if the what things that you have to think about are here, or that we have to think about, are, is the idea that we the, the current uh, world economy simply has written off billions of people as superfluous, unneeded, um, and billions more as maybe sort of precariously needed a little bit some of the time, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, apart from militarism and a, a global hegemon, a declining hegemon that's out of control and desperate to sort of reassert, you know, itself here and there, um, apart from that, we've also got this whole uh, question of, uh, I mean, there, there was times when migration, Europe used to send people here because we had work, we had land. Okay, there's a whole other problem about, which we've talked about for the last couple of days, the assumption that this was uh, terra nulla and the people who already had the land could simply be evicted. Let's leave that aside. But I mean, there are these real issues with migration. Um, but, I mean, we're, how can, the point about the welfare state and redistribution, which several of you raised, is that people really do need protection from the ravages of capital. They need some kind of work. They need some kind of income support. Um, and um, historically, that was provided by national states, social democratic states, completely <coughs> unjustly off the backs of the colonies and ex-colonies and so on. Uh, granted, that's absolutely right. Um, but unless one can talk about how we're going to reorganize the economy to give such protection and such things to people, then to stand on the border and say, you know, we're against borders, it becomes sort of playing at revolution. I'm sorry. That's it. Does anyone want to answer? Maybe I should take more questions. Maybe make a round. Okay. Um, this might be related because I'd like to pick up on the point you made about Terra Nullis. Um, I think that there was some general consensus, though I don't want to put words in your mouth, that the issue that we're facing with the refugee crisis is somewhat of a normative condition to Europe and not so much a problem that's arisen out of the blue. Um, Chiara related this to 17th century and the creation of state sovereignty as like kind of laying the groundwork for what would ultimately become a problem with migration. And I'm wondering if what happens when you frame the problem in that time period as opposed to, I would say, the 15th century, specifically 1492, when Europe started invading this side of the world. Because it seems to me that the colonist is very much the shadow of the refugee insofar as both are peoples who are, well, the right wing would say that the refugees invading Europe, bringing their foreign customs, invading and taking our land, sounds really similar to what Europe was doing to the every other part of the world since its inception. So in what, what do you occlude 
when you frame this normative condition in the period of state sovereignty instead of the invention of colonialism and invasion of territories. I'm taking two more questions and then the first round of answers. And every one of you can choose what the uh, University. Uh, my question is for Shara, I think. Uh, and it has to do in part with Nancy's postulation that if I understand correctly, uh, that we should be talking about the social totality of capital, which outstrips Europe's putative universalism. Uh, and for me, uh, something that was interesting was that you talked about the dehumanization of the refugee or its the refugee's expulsion from the legal, and I'm just as interested in how refugees also expelled from legitimacy, from the polis more generally, from every aspect of life of which the legal is only one codified representation. And so, in my mind, it seems like to speak of the expulsion of the refugee on just the level of the legal means uh, collapsing legitimacy and legality in a way that I think is problematic. And so the question comes, in as much as I'm curious about the possibility that this collapse of legitimacy and legality on European terms is a sort of more universal condition for global politics, in as much as global political institutions are occupied by European political imaginary. So is an excavation of the Europeanness of these universalized political concepts useful in as much as it might help us envision this social whole problem, uh, as opposed to sort of like a striving for a more technocratic solution for the refugee crisis or so. My name is Annika Lems. I'm actually just on a holiday in the North yeah. and heard about this event and thought it was really interesting to come. I'm an anthropologist and I'm at the moment working in Switzerland with unaccompanied minors who have basically arrived during these times of refugee crisis. And one thing I thought, and sorry for kind of invading this discussion, which seems to be mainly philosophical political scientists from an anthropological point of view, I thought what was really going on here in a way an empty, I thought there was also an emptiness in, in the sense of what is really going on in the ground, there's really a danger of romanticizing the figure of the refugee that is going on here. So the people that I'm working with have um, gone through Libya, have gone through across the Mediterranean, across Italy, have crossed many borders have really run into conflict with, with um, many police forces, border patrols, but they would never actually frame their act as a political act. Mm. So I think there is a danger of, um, for the left, I think, really has the task of trying to understand these people and, and their histories. Because the people that I'm working with, I would say, for the majority, the main, their main concern is that people actually understand why they are coming to Europe, that people actually take their stories seriously. And um, I think that there is a danger of, by describing this and generalizing this as a political act of not actually really um, taking these people seriously. And yeah, I would be curious to know how you run a certain this. I'm taking two more questions and then we have to run. So, so my question sort of resonates with what Nancy and Rand have said. Um, or at least the problem that I want to present, which is, uh, I think, from an American perspective, it's very real and that we live in New York City and this is actively happening. So, like the problem of gentrification, where like, essentially like capital invests in like um, neighborhoods and essentially chases people out of those neighborhoods, um, which I think so. For me, like. Uh, those neighborhoods having been established for a very long time as like um, you know working class or uh, in particular along racial bounds. So um, <clears throat> black and Latino and Caribbean communities in New York City, et cetera. Um, capital invests in these areas in order to like essentially chase people out of those neighborhoods and make them for like wealthy white people. Um, so it, uh, you know, this notion of borders, well, you know, you could say, let's get rid of borders, you know, and the nation state dissolves, like, um, it has a lot of, I think, repercussions for, um, for, you know, subjugated groups in, in the ways that they are able to, like, protect themselves from um, the ravages of capitalism. But this also, I mean, in, in its opposite occurs, so, like, the divestment of, like, particular communities 
such as Flint, Michigan, where we're having this huge like, um, like lead in the water crisis. So, which is a has a large population population of black people, um, and it takes on an international scope when you look at Asia and the ways that like capital invests there and in that way such a So like, I think like international capitalism could very well benefit from just getting rid of borders. So I think that there's another like, aspect of like, getting rid of borders is not just about okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the talk. Uh, just to piggyback on too many people before me already, uh, I just kind of want to bring up this issue of disposable lives. Because I think what's happening in too many of these cases, particularly in the one that Shinzia brought up uh, really early on, when you discussed the fact that uh, right now there's this big issue going on between Italy and Germany and trying to figure out who's going to pay for certain things, um, is that we do run the risk of both creating, um, taking the refugees and creating them into these romantic and overly politicized lives, but we're also creating this idea of their lives as being completely disposable and kind of uh, for the purpose of uh, almost using them as a bargaining chip and dehumanizing them in that sort of way. And to just continue Chiara's metaphor for a minute about the wolves, I mean, with Italy and with Germany, they're the ones who are trying to chase, um, chase the wolves out in terms of like maintaining capitalism, but that's what is keeping it around in such a strong way in the kind of, if we're really trying to move beyond these kinds of borders and distinctions in the way that um, we're talking about just in a political sense that also needs to be occurring in a more kind of economic sense, which you guys brought up earlier. So I was just kind of wondering about how we were able to uh, really move beyond the kind of notion of having these lives as just bargaining chips in this kind of way with the political so some of the questions are directed to all of you and some are more specific, so I just would just suggest to have a short round of answers and start um, with Daniel and then, I mean, you can just pick on whatever. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say something about capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, um, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I agree. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have to uh, smash capitalism too. <laughs> but uh, for for independent reasons, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I think there's a certain danger of making the task too big uh, to, to actually fight it. If we uh, always say, I mean, the the way you put it is, um, if we're not fighting capitalism, then we are just playing revolution. But I think if we always uh, want to make a revolution, then we cannot smash the border regime, and and so this is uh, this is I don't know. I, I would rather see it as a multi-perspective fight. We have to fight capitalism and fight the border regime, um, because only then can we take into account the complication, the complicated constellation that is playing out between borders and capitalism. I think capital sometimes has an interest in opening borders, sometimes okay. it has an interest in closing borders, sometimes it has an interest in channeling migration, but only a certain migration, and others not, and so on. And, and I think. There's, there's also a relative autonomy of the state and of the ideologies fooling, uh, fooling the state. Um, it's not clear to me who's going to win, like in this situation where there's a, there's a conflict between uh, capital that uh, 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 articulated through, what was it, Wall Street Journal or Financial Times, and uh, the states. Um, it might just as well be that capital loses this fight even though they think uh, uh, Schengen, the reinstatement of Schengen would be a good idea, simply because there's a relative autonomy of state action. So, I mean, I think we have to look very carefully of, at, at what is going on in a particular situation. Sometimes um, capital might even be uh, an ally for the fight um, uh, for open borders, and I think I'm, I, I would very much welcome such a situation, to be quite honest. Um. I'm in a peculiar position because actually I think I, I, I capitalist was present in what they said all the way through, <laughs> and I will explain why. Um, some some of the things I said actually were quite explicitly about how European capitalism is uh, reorganizing also the competing interests in this. Um, but uh, uh, 
I will add uh, a couple of, issues, of, of questions. So, uh, first of all, um, it is true that, uh, that there is this element of disposable lives or superfluous lives, as uh, Nancy said, uh, to a certain extent, though, in the sense that, uh, um, for example, if we take the, both the UA, um, European Union-Turkey agreement, but especially the migration compact so, uh, proposed by, uh, by Renzi, uh, this would, uh, the migration compact would organize also economic migration, not only the refugees. And here the, 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 the logic of the agreement would be basically uh, to, um, insofar as these migrants would be detained in the outside of the borders, so in, you know, in, uh, in Egypt, for example, in Libya and so on, um, the uh, applications for uh, lawful uh, migration would be processed in these centers. And in this way, basically, uh, the European Union would be able to select uh, what migrants, what people actually qualify for uh, migrants. So this has strictly to do with uh, uh, what kind of labor force uh, the European Union wants to import uh, in relation also to its democratic, uh, uh, demographic crisis. And uh, the distinction between refugees and, uh, and um, economic migrants <coughs> has unfortunately to do with, I agree with you, it is a matter just of, uh, you know, opportunist, uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratic opportunism, but it, it, there is also this element, which is that uh, um, according to some studies, uh, the level of qualification of uh, Syrian refugees in terms, you know, you know uh, higher education, uh, um, uh, high school, uh, uh, you know, bachelor and so on and so on, is much greater than the, the qualification of uh, migrants and refugees, because people coming from Nigeria are not these refugees, come on, uh, like from some areas of Nigeria. So a distinction cannot be really made. But the point is that the level of qualification, this is a much more spendable labor force that can be imported and exploited as cheap labor. And by the way, uh, Germany is uh, at the moment discussing a, a, a law the first law of integration of the in decades, in 60 years. Um, and I, I, I was reading about the, you know, some summary of the law, and precisely the logic of the law is precisely this. So precisely that of keeping, importing, and integrating cheap, qualified labor, labor force that, uh, that can be exploded, and, uh, and, uh, and tying the, the, the visas uh, and so on to uh, compliance with the requirements, all including work requirements. So. Um, the second thing I want to say, uh, again, uh, about capitalism is that uh, what Daniel actually was, uh, uh, was saying, I, I partially agree, except with the collaboration with the capitalist part. Uh, I partially agree in the sense that there is today, so one, uh, you know, the crisis is, uh, is an articulation of complex factors. So it, it, it's very difficult to say what is the main factor in the crisis today. And it is, uh, you know, it is a crisis with a long uh, story, you know, long, long background. But one of the elements of, uh, of a crisis has to do with the, precisely with the conflict of interest between, on the one hand, the necessity for, uh, of, that European capitalists has to maintain Schengen. This is like, they desperately need this. This would be a disaster. Um, and the pressures uh, to which uh, national states are subject uh, from the public, from an increasingly worried xenophobic public opinion. This has not, not to do only with the extreme right forces in Europe. It has also to do with, for example, the effort that, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but this is the reality, the effort that uh, the terrorist attacks in the last months are having on, uh, on moving to the right on the issue of refugees and, uh, and, uh, and migrants, the public opinion. So it's not, the problem is not just the xenophobic right. The problem is that more generally, how uh, the public opinion is, uh, is shifting, and the unfortunate, and the unfortunate uh, effect, which is precisely what they wanted to achieve, of ISIS attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in Europe. So these two elements are actually clashing, uh, and, uh, and the European governments are basically, uh, you know, uh, clashed between these two uh, op opposite forces. Uh, and just to give an example, and uh, shut up, uh, the Hungarian government, the one that built the walls, when the discussion started about suspending Schengen, actually said no, absolutely no, that they didn't want to suspend Schengen by any means. So this is a, to explain you know, the level of contradictions. And I think the outcome, the outcome is unclear. I do not, again, I think it is unlikely that we will just go back to, uh, to a national government. I don't think this is the most likely scenario. But I also think that they really don't know at the moment what to do, precisely because there are, there are pulled um, uh, by different forces, by different aspects, there are competing factors 
playing a role. And capitalism must be part of the analysis, otherwise it is impossible to understand what is happening, uh, happening in, in Europe right now. Sorry. Yes, um, uh, very quickly. Uh, definitely it's related with capitalism after the collapse of the Soviet bloc and the expansion of capital uh, globally and created all these uh, uh, permutations, both militarily, economically and uh, in, in movement. But uh, it seems to me that the privileged uh, place of struggle now, it's not the factory, it's not the nation state, it is the borders. The privileged, but it's not the, 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 the place where it will end, but it's the place where it can start. And on the capitalist fight, again, within bounded uh, territorial communities around uh, economic demands uh, of the redistribution, It has been done in the past, it played out, I think it is exo exhausted. It can be reinvented only um, in, uh, in the necessities of our time. And that's all. It doesn't mean that it's either one or the other. Uh, it has to take place there uh, with these mobile populations that are definitely produced. Not only they are produced by, by nation states, they are produced by imperial wars, capitalist wars, capital expansion. So I, I don't see... Any, contra any contradiction, just what is the privileged side uh, today? It's not anymore what it used to be 100 years ago. And this brings me to the other question. Uh, definitely what you say, it's very important, uh, others say, uh, uh, not to romanticize, uh, not to idealize. Uh, definitely, nobody wants to do that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, uh, this kind of uh, ethnographic or uh, uh, anthropological uh, um, identification with the subject uh, might be problematic. What matters is not only the intention of these populations, of these groups, uh, is the effects they have. They have been caught uh, in a world historical moment, uh, like others in the past in different ways. And uh, we need to see that uh, some of them uh, do become politicized because of this experience. Not all of them. Uh, nobody said that we have a new revolutionary subject, it was not said, but uh, to, to imply that there are uh, simply private individuals who strive only for a better future and a better life in the private uh, strategy is to miss the importance of uh, the context. That the context is we have seen movements of migrants, refugees uh, in the borders, and we have been some of us there as well, and we have met with them, and we have discussed with them. And they don't say, oh, I don't only care to find a job to go to Germany to, to get a position and to have a better future of my children. They say that what is happening uh, is political against their exclusions because of the wars that uh, the United States and Europe have been launching on them. They have a political language. They are not a simple uh, a sheer life moving uh, to find a more uh, a privilege. They have a political language and uh, don't forget that sub political subjects become politicized because of the conditions they are confronted. They are not born political in an empty space. And this is the, the place now that uh, new political subjectivities will emerge, for, both for the extreme right and both for uh, what m might become uh, the, the, the new left uh, of the future. It will not come uh, from the, the domestic uh, identifications. It will come from the politicization of movements. And it is happening. We have seen these movements. It's not something new. With the San Papier before, with the other movements before, with the, with the revolts in detention camps, uh, with, uh, the with strikes, Italian uh, irregular migrants, uh, Six years ago, in, in South Italy, engaged in a strike. They stopped work. And they organized uh, in their own associations. There is a whole uh, um, uh, uh, politicization of, of irregular migrants on many issues, on deportation, on uh, detention, on labor conditions. These things now they need to, to, to coalesce gradually, and they will coalesce, it seems to me, in the borders. Uh, at some point, uh, I don't think it will be so long, uh, a, 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 a voice, a thinker from the migrant movements, the refugee movements, will emerge and will give voice. It will not be a, another native European or, or North American will do. A Spartacus of the migrants will come. And uh, I think uh, we will see that. Uh, it will happen. So we only have... It will. Uh, two more questions and two more people can help to respond to the first round of questions. So, right. Okay. <coughs> In any case, I'll try to be very brief, so I apologize if I don't re respond to everybody, but I think um, I will just focus on, try to group questions together and focus on two issues. First, uh, when, I, when I speak about the uh, sovereign state and as being born in European modernity, I precisely mean that it's uh, just one side of uh, a whole, which includes on the one hand capitalism, obviously, and on the other colonialism. So we can discuss the um, obviously, there's no European modernity without colonialism. We can discuss the dates, but you know, 
1648 simply ratified the process of construction of uh, states, which are also an, you know, the emergence of capitalism in Europe, which happened thanks to uh, the colony system. So I see the, the there's a question of language here, but I, I, when I speak about European modernity, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, in that respect, uh, we have to be clear. I mean, particularly when it comes to Europe, we are talking about uh, um, uh, uh, a political process that it's capitalist throughout, in the sense that uh, despite uh, nice talks about Europe being a uh, the uh, visionary project to overcome wars uh, between European countries. The project uh, was successful simply because it was a process of functional integration uh, and every institution that we have at the European level is just the spillover effect of uh, uh, the, um, the uh, pushes towards free circulation of capital in the European space. So actually, what we, when we talk about Europe, we are talking about a capitalist enterprise. So in this sense, I have to say I don't agree with you. Uh, I think that the border regime is uh, uh, the tool whereby capitalists open or closes the borders according to their needs um, and the, the needs of the capital. Obviously, there's always not always uh, a, a kind of uh, um, a congruence between them. That's why I do think that we are at the moment of uh, potential uh, crisis and therefore change. Uh, but I, I do think that overall the state... Um, uh, I mean, the, the state are uh, apparatus constructed uh, by where the rule over uh, the few ruler over uh, the many, and certainly uh, the capitalists are on the side of the few, not on the side of the many. So uh, I don't see how it can happen that there's going to be an, an alliance between the many and the capitalists uh, because, uh, um, I mean, capitalists, uh, <laughs> we may say they want everybody to be rich, but actually, I don't think, I mean, history proved that that's not uh, really the case. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, with regard to this problem, which I think there exists about romanticizing the struggles um, and romanticizing the immigrants, I think this also depends on what you expect from our political theories. I don't think that, you know, a political theories or a philosopher might task is to provide blueprint for the revolution, not even to say where evolution should take place in the factory, in uh, the strike, uh, in uh, um, uh, around the borders. I see more. Uh, I'm more of an anarchist, but I see anarchy as a method. Um, it's not the blueprint for a perfect society, but it's a method. Uh, whereby in every single situation you identify conditions of hierarchy, of oppression, and you try to dismantle them with every uh, possible means. I doubt capitalists will uh, join us in this, but anyway, maybe one. <laughs> okay, just two uh, quick remarks. The first on the link um, between what I've been talking about in capitalism and colonialism. I think this link is actually... Um, present even in the migrant struggles that have been the sort of limited focus of my intervention. I just want to illustrate that with uh, th sort of three slogans uh, from that migrant activism that, that I think make this link and which also provoke in a way the European tendency to disconnect the so-called refugee crisis from anything, any historical or current process in which Europe might be involved. So Europe in this imagination of the crisis in a way figures as the sort of surprised and innocent bystander who's suddenly confronted with an unexplicable, you know, sort of catastrophe. <laughs> and I think uh, um, a lot of uh, the refugee and migrant movements actually point out that this is extremely hypocritical and also historically uh, inaccurate. And the three slogans I just want to, uh, to quote are, well, one is, we are here because you were there. And uh, <laughs> this is not only pointing to military interventions and uh, sort of political... Um, interference, but also to economic uh, relations, I think, and to you know problems that people have in their home countries precisely because of you know trade agreements and etc. Uh, second slogan, more familiar from the U.S.: "We did not cross the border; the border crossed us," um, pointing to the fact that uh, colonialism was probably the largest irregular migration in human history, and of course, um, sort of forgets that it was that. Um, third um, is the slogan: "The right to stay home." I mean. I agree with Daniel that migration you know, should not be portrayed as somehow abnormal. It is an entirely normal human 
activity, but on the other hand, most people who currently migrate would probably prefer to stay home if they could have a somewhat decent life there. And, you know, there's no reason for them to want to live in uh, cold countries with bad food and um, <laughs> away from their families and friends, like, you know, Belgium, the Netherlands. And, uh, um, okay, that, the second remark about the danger of overgeneralizing and overpoliticizing, I essentially agree with Andreas here, I think. I mean, it's a complex reality that's true, um, but uh, these claims do not come out of the blue. I mean, you have, uh, you know, a lot of empirical evidence of these things taking place at the border. I mean, you can read that every day in newspapers, right? So this is not a projection. This is a reality. And you also have really, I mean, for example, in Amsterdam and Berlin, there are really large-scale um, movements that have been built by refugees themselves, actually with very little sort of leadership or whatever from, um, you know, professional activists uh, who are based there. So I don't think it's a projection or an imposition. And there is quite a lot by now in anthropological and sociological research um, on that, but I agree. I mean, you know, one, that one shouldn't overgeneralize. But I think um, one should also ask oneself: What is the greater danger now? Is it an overpoliticization of these struggles, or is it the what I think much more current and 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 sort of hegemonic danger of uh, depoliticizing them? I mean, it's still the case, I think, in public discourse and even in in um, academic discourse that. Migrants are either perceived as refugees who are in need of help and humanitarian aid, and you know we should somehow somehow help them cope with the situation, um, which is an essentially depoliticizing uh, frame, of course, or they are seen as um, you know vil potentially at least villains, a threat, a security threat. Now, recently after the um, the terrorist attacks in Europe, that's an increasingly prominent language in the EU um, again, and um, these are two. I think much more frequently uh, employed frames than the one that we've tried to sort of feature a bit. So I think the danger is not so much over politicization, but I think still the very depoliticization that is sort of part of the larger public discourse on this. Okay, six minutes, two questions. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all for your talk. Yeah. My, my question is a little bit different than the ones that have come before. Um, I'm surprised not to hear any mention of Islamophobia or uh, peculiarity to Islamophobia. Because if xenophobia is constitutive to European identity, it can be undermined, It's the conditions for it can be undermined through uh, subverting um, uh, the nation state or you know, politicizing irregular, uh, ir irregulated migration or relaxing the rigidity of boundaries. But but do, do these uh, methods address Islamophobia um, because it seems to be um, entangled into the mess? And if, it's, if anybody on the panel thinks it is something worthy or peculiar for consideration in, in, uh, uh, because many of these refugees are fleeing from North African countries. And so that's, that's a different question, I guess, than those who have come before. Shall we just collect words instead of we really have? Uh, we have one more question. That's it. Uh, I'm sorry, but then I closed. Yeah, no, but I'm saying instead of us giving answers, yeah. collect all the questions all and the close all the, the questions. questions. I don't know. I, we okay. spoke already. So you're next. Right. It's fine. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. The last one. Uh, I, it goes in a similar direction. So what I was actually uh, thinking about is that you were mentioning a lot of transnational perspective that is necessary and that it's not only about Europe anymore uh, and it's also uh, very important to think about the externalization of the borders that Europe is doing. But when I was listening to you, you were actually not including uh, other perspectives. So I'm looking at the crisis from a Turkish perspective and uh, try to understand what's going on here. And uh, if it comes to the question of uh, citizenship, for example, I think a huge problem there is that there are 60,000 children born that do not have any citizenship. And it's not about multi multiple only, but also about how to get access to it in this new uh, situation. And there is uh, also, uh, I mean, Europe is negotiating with Turkey now since 2004 and 2005, so around this time. And, and, uh, they started actually this uh, roadmap to Europe for Turkey that is including this deal that they did now for such a long time. And 
I sometimes have the impression, since we are not really looking at the, the things that are going on in these countries that are seen as the, the ones that the borders are externalized to, we, we miss a lot of important questions also for Europe. So, and I thought it's kind of missing. It's not only the American voice, but also the, the voice of other countries, and Islamophobia will be a part of that. So, one last question at the so a really quick one, just because I heard a little bit of uh, disagreement, maybe. Um, uh, I think there was agreement that the left can't continue to be reformist and has to radicalize was the word that I heard. Uh, what does that look like? What is that? I mean, I grew up in a time when uh, radicalization of the left is assumed to be dead, and so I don't necessarily understand what that looks like, and I would like to hear the whole thing. <laughs> Can make it last quick? <laughs> and we only have two minutes, so you have to make your... I mean, who wants to answer? <laughs> I could say something on the turf. Okay. All right, go. So just a word on that. I mean, I agree that this is a perspective that is extremely necessary, especially um, in the light of, um, let's say, countering this crisis discourse, because, I mean, you know, the numbers are not insignificant in Europe, of course, but the numbers in... Turkey and all the other neighboring countries are, of course, much, much bigger, not to talk about you know, many African countries that are um, accommodating refugees from all kinds of conflicts. So, yeah, we should take these perspectives very seriously because they um, can also combat this parochialism where Europe thinks it's suffering from huge numbers of refugees, yeah. but it's pretty yeah. laughable yeah. In the, if you compare it with the first Yeah, maybe we should up. say, for those who don't know, that Turkey is, is currently something like Three millions refugees. Three millions. Yeah. So yeah. right. Register. Right. Okay, Andreas answers to the radical left. Yes, the radical. <laughs> <laughs> so you will you will you will hear it from someone who is a, a, a one or two generations before you that experienced the defeat of radical politics. So you are the, you come after the result of this defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, in this present condition, radicalization means. Uh, Definitely a project of radical transformation that will include the geopolitical and territorial component. It will not leave uh, uh, untouched uh, the existing political unities or the idea of who is in the demos as granted, but it will question and transform even the idea of membership. That is also of borders, um, uh, of communities. The liberal bourgeois uh, project that we witnessed in the last 30 years was also the neoliberal, was also revolutionary in that sense, with the European Union here, NAFTA. In the, it was also geopolitical and military. The, the radicalization of the left, if the, we can use this term without really uh, being disappointed, will mean precisely an alternative uh, geopolitical, territorial, and also economic uh, uh, vision and, and, and strategy of uh, transformation. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a question. Yes. Really have to yeah, I then it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, a slogan uh, for the end would be good. Yeah. So. <laughs> I just wanted to add one, one perspective. Uh, I'm Polish and uh, I've been here for 30 years, but what I hear now, what's going on in Poland, I'm, I'm yes. very sad about this. But you're talking about uh, 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 making left move more, more radical. This is like a one of the uh, 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 way to go. There is no left. It's very quiet in post in uh, former European countries. Yes. You both have yes. the Italian perspective. I have Italian husband, so mm -hmm. I, I know this perspective. I can give them. But in former European, East European countries. There is no really left. It's 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 coming. It's coming. New gen yes. generation, but it's very weak. People who are uh, uh, fighting now uh, or uh, trying to stand up against what's going on in Poland, is, I mean, in, in, which is shameful in, in my opinion, and in Hungary, they are liberals. Liberals who love capitalism because that's what they were going for for uh, their my generation. Uh, uh, people who have who are fifty. We remember uh, tanks on the street. We dream uh, about West. So people who fight the liberals, they are not leftists, and they ha they have to fight against very radical right now, very radical, and the uh, and president of church, which is very politicized. So it's a bigger mess. It's bigger mess, and I'm I'm actually very sad and, and confused and scared. What's going? On. I'm comfortable here. I live here, and I'm a citizen. But you know, I'm, I'm scared. What's going on? Happen? What's going to happen there? And it's a different perspective. Also, here it doesn't look so good. <laughs> <laughs>
the Trump. Which is not <laughs> No, no, definitely. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much. Just All of you, I mean, uh, for your questions, for your comments, for your um, interpretations.